Good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Bowering. I'm the market monitor for the PGM wholesale power market. Uh, as far as we can tell, the largest competitive wholesale power market in the world. I want to talk to you a little bit about market monitoring today. So as uh, we noted, please feel free to ask me questions as we go along. I'm going to go through some of the basics of market monitoring and be available to answer questions. So um, the PGM market monitoring unit was formed in 1999, initially at the same time that the PGM markets, the competitive markets created on April 1st, 1999. And since then, the we have been, the MMU has been responsible for, as it indicates, promoting a competitive market. Uh, in 2008, actually 2007, we got into a very public dispute with PJAM about independence. I testified at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that we were, our, our independence was being interfered with, but with by PJAM. As a result of that, there was a lengthy process mediated by FERC involving PJAM and all the stakeholders, which resulted in uh, market the market monitor unit being separated, spun off from PJAM, being created as a separate company. That separate company was created effective August 1st in 2008. We are monitoring analytics. We serve as the independent market monitor for PJAM, but we are entirely separate physically, financially, and uh, in an IT sense as well. So uh, in the US and in PGM in particular, market monitoring is required by order of FERC. There's a FERC order dated March 10th, 1999, which created the market monitoring unit over, it should be pointed out, the objections of PGM and over the objections of some members. And when you think about the role of market monitoring, it's also important to think about the role of competition under FERC. So competition is not the Wild West. It's not laissez-faire, as economists like to say. It's not without rules. In fact, FERC is simply using competition to replace cost of service regulation, which was the preceding regime. So the idea is to use competition to control prices, to regulate prices. And FERC has indicated that a competitive outcome, competitive markets and competitive results are equivalent to what FERC decides is just and reasonable. That is, um, FERC used to use cost of service regulation rate base rate returns supplanted that with comp competition, but competition is serving that limited role to ensure that prices are reasonable. And as we know, go ahead. Um, yeah, if you could speak a little bit louder. I think the people on the phone are having, some people okay. on the phones are having problems hearing you. Okay, okay. Uh, let me make sure the volume size will go. And uh, so is that any better? Yeah, that's way better, thank you. Okay, good. So in, uh, in markets like PGM, competitive outcomes are not automatic. We actually really need detailed rules. And the PGM tariff is thousands of pages long, and there are manuals that are more thousands of pages. So you need detailed rules. We also need detailed monitoring to ensure that the markets are really working. You need monitoring of participants. You need monitoring of the actual RTO or ISO. And you need monitoring of the rules, all of which we do. So the market monitoring unit in PGM has three basic functions. One is monitoring. So we're monitoring compliance with the rules, make sure people are actually following the rules. And we find examples almost every day, people not following the rules. We look for exercises of market power and we regularly see people attempting to exercise market power. We look back at and retrospective mitigation, that is when people exercise market power in the past and we see it. We also provide inputs to prospective mitigation. So we we, for example, tell PJM the relationship between affiliates and ultimate parents. When you run market power tests, it's important to know who the ultimate parent is to make sure you have the market design right. So that, for example, is we, we provide those inputs to PJM. Our second major function is reporting. So if you've been to our webpage, and the webpage is on the last page of these slides, uh, you'll see that we do state of the market reports every quarter. These are lengthy reports, six, 700 pages typically, which cover or try to cover every aspect of the market. We report on market outcomes, we report on whether markets are competitive or not competitive. We provide lots of details about the markets and both PJAM and members use them as reference documents and regularly cite them in FERC filings. Uh, so it's, it's wi widely used. And if you wanna get a sense of what we do, that's probably the best place to look. We also do re reports on specific issues. 
So for example, PGM runs what's called a base residual auction, a single capacity market auction once a year. We put out a 100 plus page report on those auctions. And just as an example, it's, they're called BRAs. You can find that on our webpage under reports. And just as an example, our last BRA report found that the PGM capacity market was not competitive, that there, were market power, there was market power exercise. And last but not least, and perhaps the most controversial, but still part of the tariff and part of the market monitoring unit's obligations is market design. So we have a role in reviewing whether market rules and the market design is adequate and whether there should be improvements. And the definition of adequate from our perspective is whether it provides incentives for competition, whether it provides incentives for non-competitive behavior, and whether it can be whether the rules can be improved to provide incentives to provide automatic mitigation and to otherwise make the market function more competitively. So part of part of market monitoring, as you can tell from my opening, is about being independent. You cannot be a market monitor unless you're independent, because uh, it's never in the interest of of the participants, of the RTO, or anyone else that you. Um, actually be independent and say what's actually going on in the market. So it's critical to be independent from the participants uh, and different participants have different interests from low, from generation, from financial participants, from, 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 all, uh, from all participants. It's also important to be independent from the management of the RTO. And it's important to be separately independent from the ISO RTO board of directors. So all, all three of those are critical. So slide six here just shows, in case you weren't aware of it, the basic uh, map of PJM. Uh, just to, you have that to look at if you need. The, so there, there are really two, two big PJM markets, the energy market and the capacity market. The energy market has both a day ahead and a balancing component. The capacity market has both base residual auctions, which run once a year, and incremental auctions. There are three incremental auctions for each year. It's the financial transmission rights market, or FPRs, uh, and finally, their ancillary service markets. But the two big markets are energy and capacity. And as you can see from the next slide, slide eight, if you look, for example, at the, <coughs> at the, uh, the next to the right hand, next to the right hand most column, 2018% of total, you can see that energy makes up about 61.4% 60, of the total value of the market. The total cost of wholesale power capacity makes up about 20.9% of the total cost of wholesale power. Uh, the third big component of, is transmission, which makes up about 15.2%. If you go down to the bottom in the 2018 millions column, you can see that the total PGM market's worth about $49 billion a year. But the two big, the two big components are capacity and energy, but transmission is growing in importance. And we also look at the competitiveness of transmission. Uh, just again, as a little bit of background, this shows what the total load is, about average load of about 90,000 megawatts in 2018. Uh, and then also a sense of what the generation by fuel source is. PGM is approximately a third coal, a third nuclear, and a third gas in terms of total output. At the moment, renewables are still quite small, less than a couple percent. Again, you can review this. And, and uh, finally, just for descriptive statistics, load weighted average LMP or price. So the price is about $38 in 2018. Prices have been quite low. In fact, in the first half of 2019, uh, prices, inflation adjusted prices in the first half of 2019 were the lowest in the history of PJM. Largely driven lower by <coughs> lower input costs, particularly shale gas. So back to market monitoring. The market monitoring role is primarily analytical. We don't have enforcement power. We don't have the power to, to impose penalties. We look at the compliance with the rules. We look at exercise of market power. We look at whether the rules are adequate. But we also provide information. So we regularly provide information to FERC. We're constantly in discussions with FERC. Uh, we're constantly in discussions with the state regulators. PGM is made up of 13 states plus the District of Columbia. We're in constant communication with the state regulators. They have an organization called OPSI. We're in communication with market participants and we're in communication with PGM itself. The enforcement authority <clears throat> in market monitoring is held by FERC. 
and FERC in particular has something called the Office of Enforcement, which handles that, and with whom we primarily communicate. So what's our authority? And when we see issues, we typically call up members and discuss them, ask them why they're doing what they're doing. If we find issues, we are actually required to let FERC know immediately. Uh, longer term, if we see issues and they're not going away and they, we think they need, uh, we want uh, FERC to investigate them, we make a formal referral, which could be anywhere from 20 to 150 pages of detailed analysis, which FERC may then act on or not act on. If they act on it, they start a formal investigation. As an example of that, I was, uh, I was being deposed in a court case which originated in a referral we made 10 years ago about the behavior of financial participants in the PGM market. So these things tend to drag on. As I indicated before, we also recommend modifications to the rules. And finally, we're always looking for whether there need to be additional enforcement mechanisms and additional rules. But we don't have the authority to change prices. We don't have the authority to make ad hoc adjustments in market activities. We do not have the authority to require changes in participant behavior. So even if we see someone exercising market power, we cannot make them stop. <clears throat> we cannot make PGM stop doing anything either. If we think they're doing something wrong, we cannot make them stop. Our only option is to, is to talk to FERC about it and make a filing with FERC to require them to stop. So I know there were some questions in the sheets about, about our, our basic uh, staff. So we have <clears throat> the market monitoring unit in PGM has 30, about 35 people. Uh, and interesting, when we came over from PGM, we had to start our entire, our own entire IT department. <clears throat> so we have very sophisticated IT department, about a third of our budget, about a third of our staff and more than a, much more than a third of our budget is IT. We have about a hundred terabytes of data spinning. Uh, we, we, uh, we get, we get data <clears throat> on a regular basis from PGM every day. We have a high speed fiber optic connection to directly into the control room, the control center of PJM where we get data. <clears throat> data is constantly being shipped over. Um, I have a question here. Yes. I have a question for one of the participants. Um, going back to your earlier slides, um, it says when a, a traditional market is being restructured, could the regulator start with a market monitoring unit in-house or is it extremely important to have an independent market monitor right from the beginning? Uh, PGM did start in-house. I recommend it being independent from the very beginning, so there's no question about it. Uh, and some, some in the U.S., California and uh, New England, for example, still have internal monitors. But for that to work, it, it really cannot work perfectly, in my view. So <clears throat> I would recommend that even if you start briefly with one internally, which makes sense as a way to start, that it be made clearly institutionally independent as quickly as possible. Thank you. So we have on our staff, we have economists, we have a bunch of PhDs, but we have PhDs in chemistry too. We have physicists, we have mathematicians, <clears throat> we have uh, business people, we have IT people. So we, ha we have a range of experience. We have someone who worked as a trader for a, uh, for a utility in the PGM footprint. <clears throat> so it's, it's critical to both have a wide range of expertise, but a lot of it is learned on the job. Nobody really knows about these markets until you have experience with them. So we, we have built a detailed understanding based on our interactions with the market, based on monitoring, including the basic market structure, but also the physical infrastructure, the nature of generating units, all the different types of generating units, the nature of fuel, where fuel comes from, system operations, and, uh, and as I mentioned, the whole data, data issue. Data, data is critical, data management is critical, Data analysis is critical. If there's anything that's the core of the entire market monitoring function, it's, it's massive amounts of data and being able to analyze it. So we've found, again, lessons learned, <clears throat> that interacting with everybody is really critical to so interacting with the participants, interacting with the state commissions, interacting with PJM, interacting with FERC. Uh, so we have to, we constantly interact with people, we're in constant communication with people while maintaining our independence. And that, that's essential to, to maintaining knowledge, but also to maintaining good relationships with everybody. So 
market participants and everyone else involved understands that the market monitoring unit is independent, objective, and uh, understands what, what's going on in the markets. And, and by talking to participants, we find out things that are going on in the markets we might not otherwise find out. <clears throat> we not infrequently get calls from market participants telling us about what other market participants are doing and complaining about things or noticing things in the, uh, in the markets. So, as I indicated earlier, we not only monitor the markets, we also monitor PJM. So PJM and RTOs generally play, play a huge role in running the markets. And if PJM has bad rules or PJM is <clears throat> behaving in bad ways, then that can have a, a much more significant impact than the, than the impact of any particular participant. So, so PJM plays a, a critical role in making sure that markets are working. So operator decisions have a huge role in have a huge role in price. For example, it was very very cold uh, a few years back. The so-called polar vortex here in the uh, in the mid-Atlantic part of the United States, and prices really didn't get very high. And part of the reason they didn't get very high was that the system operators turned on units on their own, basically creating extra reserves and really suppressing the price. So operator decisions can make a very significant, can have a very significant impact on price and it's critical that the design ensure that operator actions are properly priced. And that goes for, for other actions, dispatch decisions and rules in general, the way in which PGM actually applies the market power mitigation rules. So even though we develop the market power mitigation rules, they are embedded in PGM software, they run automatically. And we're not always happy with the way that the software is designed or the way that PGM does it. So it's, uh, it's, it's important that, that, the, uh, that the system operator actually run the market power mitigation rules properly through its software. And obviously calculating prices is a core function of PGM and they don't always do that correctly. So I've talked a, a bit about independence. So the requirements for independence include having adequate resources that it has an adequate budget. And I think someone asked me about the budget. So our budget is around $12 million a year. Uh, and th that is funded through the tariff. So um, the money comes is the money is paid by PGM market participants. It's a part of the FERC approved tariff. We go through a detailed uh, budget review process on an ongoing basis. Uh, our budget is actually reviewed by the Finance Committee of PJM, which includes PJM uh, management, includes PJM board members, it includes members, uh, uh, participant members. Ultimately, if anyone objects to our budget, FERC would make the ultimate decision. So far in the year since uh, August 1st, 2008, no one has objected, but there have been lots of questions about our budget. And our, our, uh, our spending has actually remained quite flat from the, from the beginning, grown only very modestly. So we, we, try to, we try to perform the function as, uh, as effectively and uh, efficiently as possible. So you have to have adequate resources. We also have to be involved in the membership process. And it, this may seem obvious, but when we, when we were in the transition to becoming independent, PGM was arguing that we should not be involved in the, mar in the membership process, that we should not be involved in market rules development, that we should not be allowed to do required analysis, and that we should not have access to the RTO. So these are not um, purely, uh, purely academic uh, points, or these, are, these were all came out of real discussions that we had with PGM. So it is important to have access to the membership. It's important to be actively engaged. We attend Many oh, we we attend all the significant PGM meetings and PGM has many many meetings. We're involved in the market rules development. We're, we do analysis uh, without without any uh, input from that is without any limits imposed by PGM. And we have access to RTO the RTO data and staff. The RTO is required to give us access to all the data they collect. So rather than us collecting data directly from the members, we rely for about. 85% of our data on PGM systems. We have created our own web-based interface, which we use to collect some other data, cost data, for example. We provide that data to PGM. PGM gathers most of the data just as a matter of running the system, but for purposes of market power mitigation and market monitoring, we, as I said, have a, a, an outward facing web-based interface that participants routinely put data, give data to us through confidentially. 
and uh, we provide some of that data to you gentlemen. Confidentiality and security is key. Having IT cybersecurity is key. We maintain confidentiality, the same confidentiality standards that PGM maintains. They can audit us and have audited us. We are routinely financially audited. So we're subject to, to review uh, from a number of sources. And then finally on this slide, independence is actually enforceable by FERC. People ask us questions, FERC asks us questions. Uh, FERC plays a key role in enforcing independence. Um, we have, a, I have another question here. Okay. Um, who sets the rules and regulations for the market monitor? It sounds like that was sort of like something that developed over time that you had a lot of input into. And is, are those rules and regulations available in the public domain? Yes. So our, our basic rules are, are called, they are attachment M as in Mary to the PGM tariff. They're in the public domain. They're on PGM's webpage. So it's the PGM tariff also called the OATT. Uh, and it's attachment M to that tariff. It's the market monitoring plan and appendix. So it's about 40 or 50 pages of detailed rules. Some of them were created way back when in 1999. Some have been modified since. But it's an, it's an interesting question as to where the rules governing us, but also governing market power come from. Because does it really make sense to have market participants vote on rules that might prevent them from exercising market power. So we've had, we've had some difficulty in getting improved rules through the process. And uh, under the Federal Power Act, there are two ways to make filings at FERC. One is called the 205 filing, which requires uh, a super majority of the participants to vote in support of it. Another is a 206 filing, which is also called a complaint, which does not require that approval. So we have had a, a running battle with PGM about whether the market monitoring unit is authorized to make 206 filings. We received a FERC order, which is public and on the FERC webpage last Friday, affirming our ability to make 206 filings. That is supporting our ability to make 206 filings and rejecting PGM's argument against that. So the issue of where do the rules come from is a very interesting one. They were originally created by FERC and PGM back in 1998 and 1999, but they've evolved somewhat. And the issue about how those rules are created is, is important. It really does not, in our view, make sense to ask the members to vote in support of market power mitigation rules, which may affect them negatively. So that, that whole process and issue is still being, is still, is still a live issue in PGM. So, Thank you. Yes, so slide 19 just talks about what we mean by the resources, staff, IT, data, so on. We actually have an in-house lawyer, which is critical to making all these FERC filings and dealing with all the legal issues and regulatory issues we have to, with the budget review process I talked about. And then um, it's also important that there be, that it look like a full-time job, that it look like a career path. And one of the issues we face is that we are, we've been under a series of Con of contracts, six-year contracts, which is a fairly good length, but we are in the process of trying to figure out a way to make the market monitoring unit part of the institution so that it's not, we're not constantly subject to review and constantly subject to potentially losing our, losing the job of being market monitor. So we're, we are actively working now with PGM management to do that, and hopefully that will get worked out in the next year or so. Uh, slide 20 just talks about really the things we have just been discussing about the involvement in the membership process and, and uh, how it's difficult to change the rules. Uh, slide 21 also just goes over some of the things we were just talking about, about, um, about 205, about the 205 filing, as well as our authority to develop and propose modifications to the rules. So slide 22, and again, this may seem obvious, but uh, when we were internal to PJM, we filed very, very little at FERC. And you'll notice if you look at our webpage, we have our filings in both before and after 2008. And since 2008, we filed hundreds of times. We're, we're, we're fi we file things every couple of weeks at FERC. Previous to that, we hardly filed at all. So being independent has meant uh, our, un, our, our, our authority to, to perform analysis without any question, our authority to distribute reports, our authority to file at FERC. All of those things are, are, have been an essential part of independence that did not exist for us when we were internal to PJM. 
So we, we do all those things as listed on the slide, including providing analysis to state commissions. As requested, we have been requested, for example, to, to provide analysis on proposed mergers. We've testified in merger cases at, at state commissions. We have, uh, we have been asked to look at market power by state commissions. Um, so, but in our, in our, our role here also includes, as I said, for example, our ability to, to do reports on the competitiveness of the markets. And PGM gets very mad at us when we point out that their markets are not competitive. For many years, their regulation market was not competitive. We pointed that out and they, they were constantly asking us to stop saying that. Same thing's true now of the capacity markets. Capacity markets are showing market power. They're showing that they're not competitive, but it's critical to be independent and to be able to say that publicly so that uh, FERC can see that and action can be taken. Slide 23, access to the RTO. I was asked about this, about data. So we, if I, as I think I said already, we have unlimited access to all RTO data. Sometimes PGM staff try to say that we don't have access to it, but we've always gotten everything we wanted. We can, we have access to the, to talk to the staff and facilities. We have access to their models, uh, software and consultants. So having, having access is key. Having access to all that data is key. We couldn't do the job without that. And we sometimes find that uh, PGM has made mistakes in their reporting, has made mistakes in their analysis, and we draw that to their attention when we do. So we've talked about uh, talked about independence. Uh, so, and this goes also to the question that was asked. So as an external market monitoring unit, we report to the PGM board, but only administratively, that is they manage the contract, uh, and, and, but we, we talk to them about substance. So we meet with the PGM board uh, four or five times a year to talk substance. They're interested in our views about why our views differ from PGMs. We have active debates with PGM management in front of the board. So that, that's it's a very useful way to communicate. Uh, but the board has no, has no authority to influence our, our analysis. And in fact, our contract so I was asked about the market monitoring plan, which is part of the tariff, which is public and on PGM's webpage. <clears throat> There's also something called the Market Monitoring Services Agreement, MMSA, which is our contract with PGM. That is also public, that is on our webpage, and it's on the PGM webpage as well, if you want to look at that. Uh, PGM has, has tried to um, use the contract negotiations as a way to um, to influence us and we have regularly resisted, but that's another reason to have the, the arrangement more institutionalized and to depend on contracts. But the key, thing, the key thing for our performance review is the board does do a performance review of us and it's just critical that they, that they do these things, that they have clear standards, that it's objective, and that there's no role for participant influence. But participants get mad at us, participants complain about us regularly to PGM management, complain about us to the board, and it's important for PGM management and the board also to make sure that they're not being unduly influenced by participants complaining. So if we find someone's exercising market power, we find a, a design issue that affects a particular sector, very frequently those members will complain to PGM about us. And you just that's just part of the job. You have to, have to deal with that. So um, 26, kind of back to the substance of market power, which is really the core of the job. And the definition of market power, in our view, is really very simple. <clears throat> I mean, in actual, in, in actual implementation, in actual review, it gets harder, but the, the, basic, the basic issue is very simple. It's either the ability to either increase or decrease the market clearing price above or below the competitive level. Um, and that there's really nothing more to it than that. And the competitive price level is always a short marginal cost of the unit setting the price. So even though it's really simple to say that, we still have thousands of pages of rules and, and lots of complex ways in which market power can be exercised and in which markets, markets function. So this is just kind of the, the very basic fundamental philosophical statement of what market power is. When we look at markets, and again, this is all in our state of the market report, but when we look at markets, we look at, we use the old fashioned industrial organization paradigm of structure, conduct, and performance. So we look at structural measures of the market. We look at the conduct or behavior measures for participants, and we look at the performance measures. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. 
So market structure, when you think about market structure, we think about both the aggregate market uh, and the local market. So the aggregate market, which is the entire market, say the entire energy market, we look at market shares. Does one company have uh, a large share of the market? We look at concentration ratios. So the herfindahl hirschman index, which is just the sum of the squares of market shares. And, and most importantly, and probably the best metric, I th we, we do believe it's the best metric, is looking at pivotal suppliers using either the residual supplier index or we, we actually have a form of that called the three pivotal supplier test, which we use in the energy market, the capacity market, the regulation market. We use as our test really across all the PGM markets. We also look at the structure of local markets. So in a network system like PGM and like any wholesale power market, transmission constraints can create local markets where, um, where you need the local generation to generate power to meet the local load. And because of the transmission constraint that, that significantly reduces competition. So we look at local markets whenever there's a constraint binding, we we'll look at the, the structure of that market and look at whether there are pivotal suppliers whether the three pivotal supplier test has failed. PGM has built the three pivotal supplier test into its market software, into its EMS, its energy management system. So whenever a constraint binds in real time, the software automatically runs the three pivotal supplier test and determines whether any participant fails it. If they fail it, they're then subject to offer capping, which means that they have their offer is a, has to be a competitive offer, it has to be cost-based offer. Um, Joe, could you go into a little bit more what this three pivotal supplier test is? I'm not sure how familiar the participants are with it. I'm not. Sure. So the, so the residual supplier index uh, simply says if you take, take imagine, in, so imagine a, an equation. So in the numerator is uh, total supply in the market. And from that subtract the supply of one supplier. You have total supply minus the supply of one supplier, and then you divide it by total demand. So if supply minus the supply of the biggest supplier divided by demand is less than one, it means that you need, you need the supply of the largest supplier in order to meet demand. And if that's true, it means that they're pivotal. It means you require their supply to meet the demand. It, gives them, it makes them pivotal. It gives them market power. So that's the broad point about the residual supplier index. The three, okay, pivotal, the three pivotal supplier test is simply says, you take total supply of the market, subtract the supply of the three largest suppliers in the market and divide by demand. So it tells you whether you need the supply of the three largest suppliers. And since the, since the one supplier uh, residual supplier index is really just testing for, for monopoly power, the three pivotal supplier test is testing for oligopoly power. And that is the structural test that's used throughout the PGM markets. Great, thanks. Uh -huh. and, then, and then finally, we also look at the structure of the aggregate market. We look at whether pivotal suppliers and, and so on. And the definition of the market changes from both local markets and aggregate markets changes from moment to moment, depending on, on load, depending on transmission constraints, depending on, uh, on on what generators are in service and what generators are not in service. So that was market structure. Participant behavior or conduct, we look at their offers. So we look at, uh, at the nature of their offers. So in PJM, you can, you can, all participants can make either a price-based offer or a cost-based offer. In fact, everyone has to make a cost-based offer and you have the option to make a price-based offer. The cost-based offers have to follow specific rules and basically have to be short on marginal cost, primarily fuel cost. Price-based offers can be anything. So, so we look, we look at we look at all that. We look at we look at short or marginal cost, and every every generation owner for every unit has to provide something called a fuel cost policy, and that's what we collect through our outward-facing web page, web application. And fuel cost policies specify uh, in an algorithmic form uh, and in a verifiable form exactly how the fuel cost is calculated every day and every hour. So for gas costs, for example, on a typical day, they might look at, uh, at uh, the fairly liquid um, 
forward market in, in uh, the US called ICE, Intercontinental Exchange. Uh, people also sometimes use PLATS and other forward, and other forward market definitions, but there, there are clear definitions in the fuel cost policies about exactly how you define your fuel cost. You could also have contractual terms in there. Uh, there are a range of ways to do fuel cost policies, but the key thing is that you have to define it clearly so that when we go back an hour later or a day later to, de to determine whether you charge the appropriate amount for fuel, we can verify it. We actually have a template for fuel cost policies on our webpage if you want to look at that. One of the key tests of, of participant behavior is the markup. So the markup, as it says here, is price minus cost divided by price. So if the, if the uh, and, and you can also, also have cost in the denominator if you, and sometimes that's a better way to look at it. But the point really is it's the, it's the relationship between the price-based offer and the cost-based offer. So if price-based offers are significantly higher than cost-based offers or even higher at all, we regard that difference as the markup. And the markup is in, typically an indication that, that a unit is attempting to exercise market power. Uh, so we look at markup as an indicator of, uh, of potential exercise of market power. We also look at operating parameters, which are the parameters are every bit as important, if not more important than the actual level of the offer. And operating parameters mean everything from a minimum runtime to a maximum runtime, to the maximum number of starts per day and per week, to the ratio between the maximum output and the minimum output. So there, uh, there are a number of key parameters that can affect the way in which units are committed, the way in which they run, uh, and limits on PGM's ability to, to operate them to meet system needs. And last is outage behavior. So outage behavior can, can be gamed uh, it's in people, it's in unit owner's interest, at least in PGM, to minimize your outages because the higher your outage rate, the less you get paid for capacity. So outage behavior and whether things are truly physical or are not is, a, is an important part of what we look at. And finally, so we have, we have market structure, we have uh, individual uh, owner or participant behavior, and now we have the performance of the market. So overall, we look at the market markup. That is, what is, what is the uh, markup component of average prices? So we actually um, have learned how to do over time. We can, we can actually analyze the impact of every marginal unit in every five minute interval on average price. So we have access to all the detailed data that goes into the way that prices are formed. So Typically in a system as big as PGM, there are multiple marginal units. Uh, sometimes one, but sometimes as many as three, four, five, six, even more. But in every, for every marginal unit, every marginal unit is affecting price across a range of buses. And we can calculate the impact of each marginal unit on every bus in the system. And therefore can calculate, and this is in the state of the market report, we can calculate the impact of individual unit markups on the overall price. So one of our key measures is what proportion of total price is markup. And again, we have that on the table in the energy section of the state of the market report. It's typically somewhere between three or four and 10%. So as that moves up, that's an indicator to us that, that uh, market power is affecting the price in the system and it's a, an indicator of potential need to act. A second key performance metric is net revenue. So net revenue is uh, the energy market revenue plus ancillary service market revenue plus capacity market revenue minus short or marginal costs. And if that, if that revenue, if that net revenue is enough to cover all of your costs, all of your fixed and variable costs, then that's an indicator that the incentives are adequate in the market to both maintain existing investment and to invest in new assets. If it's less than that, then it's an indicator that units are not recovering their full cost. And if it's more than that, obviously it means that there's a strong incentive to continue to enter. We, have, we calculate this in each of our quarterly and annual reports. We report that metric, but that's, that's a, it's a critical metric for the, as, an, as an indicator of the viability of the market. That is, um, whether the market is really providing the kinds of incentives necessary to be uh, to be uh, uh, to, to really to survive to to 
be able to uh, continue. Uh, so on slide 31, which is some of the some of the details about uh, the market monitoring we do. So I, I know that we want to leave a little bit of time for separate questions. So I, I'm happy to um, stop for a moment and see if there are additional questions or people have questions they've been saving up. Um, yeah, I, I would advise if, if you have a question, go ahead. Um, Joe doesn't mind answering questions as we go along. And that's what we've been doing so far. So if you do have questions, go ahead and, and put them up on the question and answer panel. And I will be, um, I will continue to interrupt Joe with questions as they come in. But we don't have any pending, any more pending questions right now. We've answered the two that we got in. Okay. So uh, this just points out each, each of the markets. So the, the energy market, both day ahead and real time and day ahead really requires distinct monitoring from real time because the day ahead market in PGM has financial participants and the real time does not. Uh, but each market requires distinct monitoring at distinct metrics and looking for distinct behaviors. Uh, PJAM is a nodal market that is, is a separate locational marginal price at every pricing node and there are thousands and thousands of nodes in PJAM. But having a, we, we believe having a nodal market is really the only way to have an efficient market and, and PJAM, I think all of the markets eventually evolved to nodal markets. California resisted, Texas resisted, but they have gone to nodal markets and I think they realize that they're, it's a more efficient, uh, efficient way to run the markets. Around the world, surprisingly few nodal markets. Uh, Europe is not nodal. Uh, and uh, there, there are relatively few other countries that actually have nodal pricing. Uh, Canada is not nodal, for example. Um, but nodal, uh, uh, not interesting, Australia, which was one of the first markets, is also not nodal, although they're talking about it. But when you have nodal markets, it's increasingly complex because you actually have individual node behavior. Uh, but it's also reduced complexities because you don't have you don't have all the workarounds that you need to have in a non-nodal market. PGM actually tried to run a non-nodal market one year in, in uh, 1998, and it failed because uh, there was a single price signal, uh, and the price signal was. We needed more energy in the east, less in the west, but a single price signal meant that every generator turned up its power, uh, and, and the result was that the system really broke down and PGM had to manage it manually. So the, there, there are significant advantages both operationally and, and from a competitive perspective to having nodal prices, but everyone has to deal with that in their, in their, own, in their own individual market. As I noted, in the day ahead markets, we have purely financial transactions. So what we call inks or increment offers, which are financial supply, simply an offer to supply with nothing necessarily backing it up. Uh, DEX or decrement bids, which are um, bids to buy, again, without necessarily anything buying it up, backing it up. And also something called UTCs or up to transmission, uh, up up to congestion uh, transactions, which are purely financial. It's really just a spread bid between two nodes. So if you, for example, if you sell in the head market using ink and you don't do anything else, your position is closed out in real time. You become a buyer in real time. Actually have to pay the real time price to, to clear your position. Uh, we have, as I noted, FPRs. FPRs at the moment are based solely on Day ahead congestion, although it should really be based on day ahead and balancing congestion. And their interactions between FTRs and financial transactions. We, in PGM, we have something which we wrote, which is called the FTR forfeiture rule. And it says that if you use a financial transaction to make your FTR more valuable uh, and you fail, the, you fail the, the test that, and this test is described in the state of the market for it, but if you fail the test, you have to give back the profits uh, on that FTR hour by hour in which you failed that test. So one of our one of our goals is to try to have more automated tests like that so you don't have to, so we don't have to take an individual action against a participant every time uh, something is not quite right. It's uh, it's it's much much more efficient and gives participants clear rules and clear guidelines about what they can and cannot do. We also have ancillary service markets. The regulation market in PGM is actually um, a terrible design. We in PGM actually agree about the design. We have filed at FERC to improve the design, but FERC has so far rejected those improvements. 
uh, but just an example of uh, of one of the one of the ancillary services. And there are key interactions between and among the regulation market, for example, and uh, and the energy market, because and and the reserve markets as well. So if you provide regulation, you're not providing energy. If that's costing you money, there's something called an opportunity cost, and that opportunity cost is part of the price of the regulation market. Uh, so as it says on slide 32, there are um, lots of complicated ways to exercise market power, in, uh, both in PGM and really any market. So we have had people use what's called uplift or operating reserves in PGM. We have people have people manipulate those rules to get paid uplift. So, for example, if you want to get paid uplift, uh, you might try to increase the minimum runtime of your unit. So say PGM really only needs your high priced unit for an hour, but you have created a minimum runtime of 24 hours. Then if PGM turns it on for one hour, they have to pay you for 24 hours. And if the price, if the LMP is not greater than your cost or greater than your offer, then PGM has to make you whole for that entire offer. And that, that make whole payment is called uplift. And uplift in PGM has been very high at times. It's been quite low recently as a result of increased attention by us and by PGM to uplift. We have someone who looks at uplift payments to generators every day and actually calls up PGM and asks them why they're paying uplift and, and in many cases uh, get, gets it to be reversed. So we pay very careful attention to amount of uplift being paid to individual units and why. We pay careful attention to bid parameters, the minimum runtime. Again, I just use as an example for the very reason that they can affect prices and they can affect payments to units in inappropriate ways. Units retire. For every, every time a unit retires, we are required under our tariff to evaluate whether it's a form of physical withholding. That is someone saying they want to retire the unit in order to make their portfolio more valuable when the unit itself is actually economic. So we do a detailed financial analysis of the unit, uh, the unit retirement, and, and are required to provide an opinion within 30 days about whether that retirement is market power or not. And we have generally found the retirements to be fine, but not in every case. We found situations where we did believe that retirements were a form of market power. Uh, loop flows in a, in a big system like PGM, surrounded by other systems, there are flows of power across the system and it's possible to uh, to engage in, in transactions that are really not real economic transactions that are gaming gaming the rules. We've called them sham schedules. We've written about them in the State of the Market Report. And as I mentioned, the last one, the FTRs, Inks and Ducks, that's the FTR forfeiture rule. We wrote that rule. It's now, uh, we, we run it, PGM runs it. People get billed for it every month. Uh, and in fact, there's an active debate going on in PGM right now about the nature of the FDR forfeiture rule. But again, that's an example of a rule that we have um, we have helped develop and get put into the rules. Um, we do have some questions now. We have two more questions. Great. great. Um, first question is: In the event where the independent market monitor is, is unable to identify unfair mar participant behavior. Who bears the consequences, the IMM or the regulator? Okay, so so let's just say that so somebody actually does something wrong, we don't see it, PGM doesn't see it. Who bears the consequences? I would say that um, if it's irreversible, then the consequences are borne by the market. Let's just say that somebody raises the price above where it should be, and we don't, and we're not capable. We just lost you, Joe. I'm not sure what happened. Hello? I still see you up here, but all of a sudden I can't hear you. I'm not sure what happened here. I'm glad that we're on the second to last slide for this. Um, okay, yeah. yep, you're back. I can hear you. Okay, good. And there are, and there are provisions in the tariff governing that. 
Okay, we, we lost you at almost at the beginning answering that question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you, and we've also lost your screen share. Really? So if you want to put that back up again. Okay. Uh, um, even, although you're on the last slide, I guess it doesn't matter that much. Um, but so that, I guess so for the webinar, for the recording, it's important to have that last screen, particularly for contact information and stuff. Did we lose you again? Hello? Okay. I'm not sure. Yep, sorry, I, I'm not sure what's happening there, but I, I saw that I was off. I'm back now? Yes, you're back now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. So anyway, was there, was there, another, was there another question? Well, we didn't hear the answer to the first question. Sorry. So the short, the short version of the long answer I apparently only gave to myself is that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That was that neither the RTO nor the marker monitor units are liable for making mistakes. So if we miss something, and prices are too high as a result, then prices are too high, and people pay those higher prices. So the consumer would be the person yeah. who's who bears the consequences i guess basically now clearly if we if we made a mistake and we were responsible for it and it was a, a significant thing then we could be fired um recently there was a an event in the ftr market in pjm where uh, pjm missed some issues and a number of senior executives at pjm were actually fired as a result so i mean there are there are consequences yeah um there's another question a second part to this question um, how are other participants who were adversely affected by such distortions in prices compensated? They are, they are not. Yeah. Um, now, some, sometimes there are fines paid and uh, very significant fines, some, some cases many millions of dollars. Those dollars typically go back to PGM participants. So they would be compensated in part by being paid the, the, the fines, but those are, those are typically not anywhere near the actual damage to the market. And FERC has so far never required PGM to rerun a market. So if prices were $200 and they should have been 100, FERC has never required PGM to rerun the market. Okay, thank you. All right, so one last question. Uh, do nodal markets result in very different prices in different areas? And um, this person is uh, from Europe and says, I think that's why Europe tends not to have them to try not to unfairly penalize customers in certain regions. Right, but so the, those, the two parts of this question don't go together from my perspective. So yes, it does mean that prices can be very different in different regions, but it's actually unfair to make, in my view, to make everybody pay the same price. If it costs $100 or 100 euros to generate power in one area and $200 to generate, or 200 euros to generate power in another area, that is the right signal to send both to generators and to load. It costs more to, to produce power, it costs more to consume it in that location. And if you don't do that, then you have the incentives to locate in the higher cost areas are, are eliminated and the incentives to engage in demand side management and the incentives to engage in more rational consumption behavior don't exist. So yes, it does mean that, but the purpose of locational marginal pricing is to charge the the actual uh, marginal cost of power in each location but one, one thing to remember about that even in, in pjm even though forces have been loaded and zonal so prices to load is not actually paying a pure locational price and for example in europe that could mean that uh, that large portions of countries could pay a single price while generators did receive the low additional marginal price. In so theory, what, everyone could pay the same price. All consumers could pay the same price, right? Yeah. You just average out the cost. Yes, that, that, that's correct. Yeah. That is correct. And there are also locational differences in the in the PGM capacity market between between areas as well. So yeah, it's an it's an interesting debate. I, I think I think that a version of locational marginal pricing is more efficient, but you're right, it can it can absolutely result in different prices for power in different areas. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Do you want to try put up that last slide? <laughs> uh, Hit the share screen. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Let me try it again. Yeah, let's see. There we go. Okay. Okay, perfect. Great. Any uh, any further questions? I think we're good. I don't have any more questions. Okay. Okay. If there is no more questions, then uh, and it's ten o three, then I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Especially, um, I would like to thank Joe, who has been kind enough to make this presentation for us. Um, it was very interesting. We will be uh, uploading this webinar to our website. And I have made the um, presentation available. I sent out the presentation this morning. You should have it in your inbox if you haven't seen it already. Let me know if you haven't received it. And if anyone has further questions for me, feel free to email me at the company mailbox at the, on the last slide, or you can email me directly at joseph.bowering at monitoringanalytics.com.